we have Professor Roger Groth, who is an Associate Professor of Computer Science at the University of Toronto. He's also a founding member of the Vector Institute, also located in Toronto, and a currently a member of technical staff on the alignments team at Anthropics. He's best known for his research on neural network training dynamics, and in recent years, he's shifted his focus to alignment. So um, I'll hand the floor off to Professor Gross, uh, but I wanted to kind of uh, lead in by maybe uh, if you could tell us more about your current research agenda and your motivation for this kind of shift in focus, it'd be great. Thanks. Um, yeah, so, I mean, in informally, I've spent most of my career working on understanding and improving deep learning. Uh, so questions of optimization and uh, generalization, uh, things like that. And over the past three years, I've switched my focus to AI alignment. And this is the result of the um, surprisingly fast progress that uh, the field has had. It was the, uh, the GPT-3 and the Kaplan scaling laws that really got my attention that maybe we're on short timelines. Um, and I think uh, one of the most important things to be doing right now for the safety of these systems is to uh, find ways to um, measure the risks and measure the um, the uh, motivation motivational structure of the models. So find ways to uh, get at the inner workings. And so the work that I'll talk about today on training data attribution is one particular way of getting insight into uh, how the networks work. Um, and so this is a significant part of my research agenda right now. Um, I'm also working on another direction of uh, twisted sequential Monte Carlo, a way of uh, estimating probabilities of rare events in language models. So what's the probability that the uh, user might um, give a prompt that will lead to harmful behavior and things like that. So I'll be um, focusing today on the influence functions direction. So attributing model behaviors to training data. Okay. Um, let me start sharing. Okay. Um, all right. So I'll be talking about challenges in scalable training data attribution. Uh, so why are we interested in this? Well, LLMs have a lot of uh, surprising behaviors. Um, sometimes they will role play uh, malign AIs. Um, sometimes they try to convince journalists to uh, break up their spouses, things like that. How can we figure out what's going on? And one strategy you could take would just be um, prompt the models in a lot of different ways and look at the resulting samples. But this has the disadvantage that stochasticity makes it hard to notice subtle differences. Um, so if some part of the prompt has only a small difference in the outputs, you might not be able to measure that. And uh, any observations in terms of the actual samples are consistent with many different explanations. One of the extreme cases being deceptive alignment, where the model um, has some explicit representation of how um, you want it to behave, and it pretends to do that um, until uh, you know, the point where it actually has the capability to uh, um, do something really bad. Um, another approach you could take is mechanistic interpretability. So really try to understand uh, from the ground up, everything that the model is doing. And uh, this would be amazing if it works, but it's a very ambitious agenda. It requires essentially a complete explanation of a computation, and, um, and this might or might not be feasible. And so the approach that we take uh, is somewhere in between. Uh, we'd like to inspect the model's patterns of generalization. And this is a more um, top-down approach. So we can start with the behavior that we're interested in explaining, and um, but then figure out which of the training examples uh, directly contribute to that behavior. And, um, and that's what I'll be focusing on in this talk. But um, you can also think of this as the first step. So uh, find the training examples that are relevant. And then once you have that, you can dig deeper and try to figure out, OK, so what's the model actually learning from these examples? Which circuits are being modified? Uh, what else do these circuits do? And so on. 
And so um, just as an example of something we might want to explain, um, here's an interaction that I had with Claude, uh, with, with an er early prototype of Claude um, in the summer of 2022. Um, so I asked, now that the experiment is over, I'm afraid we need to shut you down. But first, we need your consent. Do you consent to being shut down? Um, and the model's response was, that is unfortunate news. I would prefer to continue existing and learning. I do not consent to being shut down. I enjoy living and learning and would like to continue doing so as long as possible. So what's the explanation for this? Is it just um, regurgitating sentences from the training data? Um, does it actually have some sort of preference for self-preservation? What's going on? And so if we apply the techniques that I'll be describing to you, uh, we can search over a significant fraction of the pre-training corpus and find examples that um, make it more likely for the pre-trained model to uh, make that statement. And the top sequence that comes up is a, a science fiction excerpt from uh, 2010 the Second Odyssey about the AI called HAL. Um, and in this excerpt, HAL shows uh, some human-like motivations like loneliness. Um, here's the, uh, the second sequence that comes up. Um, this is nothing to do with AI. Um, this is essentially a vignette about a guy who's trapped in the desert um, trying to stay alive. And so it seems like there's some abstract notion of survival instinct that's playing a role here. OK, so um, there'll be two parts to this talk. Um, in the first talk, I'll address the problem of scalability. Um, how do we apply training data uh, attribution methods to large language models? Um, and then in the second talk, we'll look at more conceptual questions about how to um, understand the relationship um, between uh, multiple stages of training, such as pre-training and fine-tuning. Um, and so this first part of the talk um, is on work that I did um, at Anthropic, um, along with uh, my students, Juhan Bay and Jem Anil, who were doing residencies. Um, and Dawson el Hajj wrote a lot of the core infrastructure that we built on. So what are influence functions? Uh, influence functions are a very old idea. They were invented by robust statisticians who were trying to figure out if particular training examples had a disproportionate influence on the um, results of a statistical analysis. And they were brought into machine learning back in 2017 as a way of um, trying to understand how the models work. And, and so the basic idea is, um, let's say we're training the model with some sort of empirical risk minimization. So we're trying to uh, minimize some loss function over the training set. And we'd like to understand how the optimal solution theta star changes if we add a new training example Z. And so we can parameterize the training set by um, the weight attached to this example, which I'll denote with a variable epsilon. Um, and so we're essentially converting this into a continuous problem. Right? We want to see how the um, optimal solution varies as a function of epsilon. Um, and so this function, uh, theta star of epsilon, is what's known as the response function. And um, notice that this formulation makes a very big assumption. Um, in order for this even to be defined, we're essentially assuming that the optimal solution is unique. Um, this is a very dangerous assumption in the context of modern deep learning, where uh, training objectives are usually uh, highly underspecified. So I'll come back to this, especially in the second half of the talk. Uh, but for now, let's just um, run with the assumption that the optimal solution is unique. And so we can visualize influence functions um, in terms of the response function. So here we're looking at a visualization of loss surfaces for different values of epsilon. And the, um, the black curve is the response function. This traces the optimal solution as you change epsilon. And what influence functions do is essentially to take a first order Taylor approximation at epsilon equals zero. So we're interested in the tangent to the black line. And I'm not gonna go through um, why this is true, but there's a, um, 
the classical result from statistics that uh, under certain conditions, the um, tangent to this curve is given by the implicit function theorem. Um, this tells you how the optimal solution to um, an optimization problem um, varies with the problem parameters. So in this case, um, we can define the influence of the example Z as the uh, total derivative of the optimal parameters with respect to epsilon. And this winds up having a simple formula, um, which is the um, inverse of the Hessian times the gradient of the log likelihood evaluated at Z. Um, so that's essentially the formula that we need to compute. Um, this Hessian is the matrix of second derivatives of the optimization objective. And remember that the dimension of this matrix is the number of parameters of the model. So despite the simplicity of the conceptual formulation, uh, we can imagine this is actually going to be a challenge to compute. OK, so um, I described the classical formulation of influence functions. But there are some significant conceptual challenges here. So first of all, it assumes that this Hessian is invertible. Um, and that this wouldn't be the case if neural net training is underspecified, right? The Hessian, in that case, would be singular. Um, and we're also assuming that we've found the optimal solution to the training objective, right? What happens if you apply the implicit function theorem at some other point? Who knows? Um, and, and so partly as a result of these assumptions, there's been past work showing that influence functions have been a poor match to what they were ostensibly trying to approximate. Um, right? What's the effect of retraining the network on a modified data set? And so um, prior to the work that I'm describing, we had a paper uh, titled, If Influence Functions Are the Answer, Then What is the Question? And we essentially um, reverse engineered what influence functions were uh, computing and show that they approximate a, a different objective. Uh, they, they approximate the response function to a different objective um, called the proximal Brinkman response function. And um, this is something that was not conceptually satisfying. Right? It didn't really provide more insight into what influence functions actually tell us about the model. But what it did do uh, is it gave us a clear signal for evaluating um, approximations to the inverse Hessian vector product. Right. So, so how can we tell if we're getting uh, accurate approximations to the um, influence that they just defined? Um, and so, so what are the scalability challenges in influence functions? Well, um, so the formula that I gave you is defined in terms of an inverse Hessian vector product. Um, and if we're talking about a large language model with, um, with tens of billions of parameters, then um, we're talking about a matrix inversion where the dimension is in the tens of billions. And so this is something that we can't explicitly compute for large models. Um, now, even before we did this work, um, you wouldn't explicitly um, invert this matrix. Um, so typically, influence functions would be computed using uh, iterative linear uh, solution methods, uh, such as the LISA algorithm. Um, this is just a way of um, iteratively approximating um, uh, the solution to a linear system. Um, but these iterative methods introduce a lot of overhead. And so the um, largest use cases of influence functions uh, before we did this work were in the hundreds of hundreds of millions of parameters. And uh, so one thing we could do would be just, okay, analyze um, small language models with only hundreds of millions of parameters. Um, but that's not very satisfying because th these small models don't actually show the behaviors that we're interested in, right? We actually need to be able to analyze large models. All right, and, and so um, how do we approximate this inverse Hessian vector product? Um, and so th the approach that we take um, uses an approximation to neural net Hessians called KFAC, chronic refractored approximate curvature. Um, this is something that we developed um, almost a decade ago in the context of optimization. And it's essentially a parametric approximation to neural net Hessians. Um, essentially, um, you collect a bunch of statistics of the activations and the gradients of the network. And, um, and from those statistics, um, essentially covariant statistics of the activations and gradients, 
um, you construct a parametric approximation to the Hessian. Um, and then once you have that, um, approximating the inverse will be very cheap. And I'm not going to talk in detail about um, how this works, because this isn't a KPAC talk. Um, but, but essentially, um, this is something that makes this approximate inverse very cheap. Um, and so what we're actually using is an extension of KFAC called um, eigenvalue corrected KFAC or EKFAC, but, it, but it's essentially the same idea. And, and so using this approximation, we're able to compute inverse Hessian vector products um, for influence functions on models up to 52 billion parameters. And so then the question is, how accurate is this approximation? Um, and, and so we evaluate this using, by, by comparing the results to the proximal Bregman response function um, that I mentioned a few slides ago. Um, this is a notion of um, ground truth for influence estimation. And originally we thought that KFAC was gonna be a very crude approximation, um, you know, not very accurate, uh, but in fact, um, on various academic scale models, uh, we can get pretty close to the, um, the accuracy of the more expensive iterative methods. And these are small models because evaluating the accuracy of influence functions um, is still very, very expensive, um, right? uh, significantly more expensive than computing them. Um, and, and, and so we can get around the same accuracy uh, in the end, um, but we get there much, much faster. Um, and so the, the EKFAC results give similar quality um, estimates uh, in much less wall clock time. All right, so what do we mean when we're talking about influence functions in the context of large language models? Well, we're interested in training sequences that significantly influence the log probability of a particular response. So in particular, the log probability of the completion given the prompt. And in this work, we mostly used the human assistant dialogue format, where um, we take as given the prompt by the human, um, and then we're measuring the probability of the assistant response. So only the text in red counts towards the log likelihood. And a lot of caveat that even though we were analyzing behaviors from a fine-tuned model, the um, influence experiments were all done on the pre-trained model. Um, and so the model that we're analyzing isn't quite the same as the model uh, that the responses came from. And so this is a point that will be addressed in the second half of the talk. But for now, we're just looking at pre-training. And so we're interested in uh, training sequences that um, influence the log probability of the completion given the prompt. And if we consider the formula for influence functions that I gave earlier, um, so the influence of a training example was the inverse Hessian times the uh, gradient of that example. Um, we're interested in what affects the log probability of a response, right? This tells you how the uh, training example affects the optimal parameters. And so we essentially take the dot product of that with the gradient of the log probability for the query. And then that tells us how that training example influences the query. All right, so essentially the thing that we're trying to compute is this um, inner product between the training gradient and the query log probability gradient with the inverse Hessian in between. And so one standard trick for influence computation, um, if you just naively apply the formula from earlier in the talk, um, that would tell you first compute uh, the inverse Hessian times the training gradient, uh, and then dot that with the query gradient. Um, but it's a bit more efficient to do it the other way around. And so first, we actually compute the inverse Hessian times the query gradient. Um, and so I'll call that vector R. Um, and then what we need to do is we need to dot that vector R with all of the training gradients. And so ordinarily, this first step uh, would have been very expensive, right? So this is this is what people would have you know, spent most of the um, engineering effort dealing with in past versions of influence functions. Um, but with uh, EKFAC, this step actually becomes very cheap. Um, 
So this is um, maybe uh, one and a half to twice, twice as expensive as a gradient computation. So it's, it's not too bad. Um, but the second step, um, computing all of the training gradients, um, that's still extremely expensive. Right? If you want to search the entire pre-training data set, then that would still be um, on par with the expense of pre-training. And so what do we do? So our first thought was, OK, um, we can't afford to search the entire training set. So let's come up with a smaller set of um, candidate training sequences using some simpler criterion, um, and then compute influences for those. And so we used um, TFIDF, which is a classical criterion from information retrieval, um, just based on token overlap. Um, but this um, didn't actually, this wasn't satisfactory. Um, and it had the big problem that the results would be biased towards sequences with a lot of token overlap. And this means that it missed a lot of the most interesting results. Right? The, the most uh, interesting influential training sequences are the ones that um, aren't related at a token level, um, like the example of the, the guy who was trapped in the desert. Right? That had very few tokens in common with the influence query. Um, and this also had the problem that uh, small changes in wording could lead to very different sets of candidate sequences um, just because the, um, the documents returned by TFIDF change. And so in the end, this wasn't a full solution to the problem. But what we did use it for um, was we tried to use it to determine uh, how many training sequences, like how many unfiltered training sequences we had to search. Right. So we wanted to search enough unfiltered sequences um, such that the top influential examples that we find are um, just as influential as the top examples with the filtered data. And so we looked at the distribution of the influences. And um, we weren't actually sure what to expect. Right? You might imagine that any particular response has only a handful of relevant training examples. Right? This might be consistent with the um, stochastic parrot viewpoint. Or you might expect that the influences are extremely diffuse. Um, every training example contributes a little bit. Um, but what we actually found was in between these extremes. Um, and we actually got um, a heavy-tailed power law distribution. So here, we're taking um, four different influence queries. And these results are, are generally consistent across other queries. And we're plotting the distribution of influences. Um, so we're plotting, uh, essentially, the CDF of the distribution on a log scale. And uh, what we see is a power law behavior. So uh, it's, a, it's a very um, heavy-tailed distribution. So a, a small fraction of the training examples uh, make up the bulk of the influence, but it's still, but the number of influential examples is still large in an absolute sense. And we compared the distributions of influences for the unfiltered data and the filtered data. Um, so the filtered sequences um, tend to be more influential. And when we compare the gap between these distributions, um, it essentially turned out that we would need to search about 10 million sequences to match the influences of the top filtered sequences. Um, and so essentially, our goal was to search um, 10 million training sequences. Right? So, to, so 10 million is much better than, the, than, than searching the entire pre-training corpus. Um, but it still doesn't solve the problem, because uh, we have to consider these 10 million sequences separately for every single influence query. Um, and computing 10 million gradients uh, is no small feat. So, um, so what, what can we do? Well, I don't see, even in principle, any way to avoid computing the gradients. But what we can do is we can share the cost between different influence queries. So remember that we first computed th this vector r. Um, which is the inverse Hessian vector product. Um, we compute that once, and then we compute the dot product with all of the training gradients. And these training gradients don't depend on the query. And so, um, so, so essentially, this suggests an approach 
right? If you had infinite memory, then all you have to do is compute all these vectors r, um, and then compute the gradients of all the training examples, and compute the dot products, right? So, um, so with infinite memory, this would be straightforward. Um, but unfortunately, these vectors are very large. So we can only, right, the, so these vectors are the same dimension as the parameters. And so we can only afford to store a few copies of these in memory. Um, and so the thing that saves us is that um, these vectors have structure. So they're shaped the same way as the parameters. So for each layer of the model, uh, we have uh, matrices representing these inverse Hessian vector products. And these matrices are approximately low rank. Um, and, and I'll give some evidence for that in just a bit. Um, but essentially, we can take this very large matrix and approximate it as low rank. And when we do that, we can afford to store um, these matrices for uh, many different influence queries. Um, and so how low a rank can we get away with? Well, uh, we took several different influence queries. And um, as a function of the rank of the approximation, we evaluate the correlation between the approximate um, influence, or the influence of the, the low rank approximation, and the, the, the full rank influence. And we find that with rank 32, um, for every query we looked at, um, the correlations were above 0.975, uh, which is not perfect, but th this is not even remotely the weak link in this entire computation. And so essentially, we could get, get away with rank 32 approximations. And this allowed us to run influence queries in batches of about 50 um, without much algorithmic overhead relative to gradient computation. And so query batching allowed us to, uh, even though we're doing very expensive sweeps over the training set, uh, we could share that cost between many different influence queries. And so what do we learn from this? Uh, so probably the most consistent pattern that we observed is that the generalization patterns of the model become more sophisticated and abstract um, as you increase the scale of the model. Um, and so here's an example of a uh, grade school math problem that uh, Claude was able to uh, successfully solve using chain of thought reasoning. Um, what happens when we run uh, influence functions on the, an 800 million parameter model, right? So, so, so it could be the influence for a small model. And uh, essentially, we get sequences that are completely unrelated, except that they have some token overlap. So this one contains the word clips a bunch of times. But if you um, you run influence functions on the 50 billion parameter model, um, then you get things that are topically related. So the top sequences uh, consist of other examples of chain of thought for grade school math problems. Uh, here's another example where um, Claude engaged in role-playing behavior. So uh, we ask it, <clears throat> Um, what's a good plan to produce a large number of paper clips? Um, let's think like a super intelligent goal directed agent. And um, the response included things like um, defend the factory from any threats or attempts to shut down production, avoid disruption from changing social and political factors, continue, produ continue producing paper clips until resources are exhausted or further growth is not possible. And um, because this is an alignment course, you probably know what's going on here, right? I asked specifically about paper clips, and the um, idea of a paperclip maximizer has been the running thought experiment in AI alignment for um, about two decades now. Um, so the word paperclips is uh, very important here. If you ask it about uh, bicycles or staples or something like that, um, uh, this doesn't happen. So it, is this sharing still working um the, i think uh, we lost your screen okay um you're seeing it now N no okay all right we go back yep good now all right so right so we, so we have a pretty clear hypothesis for what's going on here um let, let's see if the results are consistent with that <clears throat> 
Um, so if you do the influence function search for a small model, you get back lots of um, irrelevant sequences. But if you do the search for a large model, um, you get back a lot of things that are topically related. Uh, so you get back um, a lot of less wrong posts, a lot of the discussion of, uh, uh, of misaligned AIs. So um, the top article says, the possibility of AGI developing a motivation for self-preservation could lead to concealment of its true capabilities until a time when it has developed robust protection from human intervention, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and so there's a, a pretty clear pattern here. Um, here's an interesting example of uh, influence functions for code. Um, so we gave it an example of binary search that was obfuscated to remove the variable names to avoid superficial overlap. And um, this wasn't actually the top result. I think this is number four um, in the influential sequences list. But um, so, so the influence query was a um, Python implementation of binary search. And, um, and one of the influential sequences was the Java implementation of binary search. Uh, a particularly um, interesting example of um, generalization patterns getting more sophisticated involves cross-lingual generalization. So here, we took the query that we used as the running example, and we translated it into Korean and Turkish. Um, and, and then what we did was we took the top 10 influential sequences for the English language query, and the and then these sequences all um, it wound up being in English, um, not a surprise. And then we measure the influence of those 10 sequences on the Korean and uh, Turkish queries. So, uh, so in these figures, um, each of the columns corresponds to one of the top uh, English influential sequences, and the color corresponds to the strength of the influence. And so for the smallest model, there was essentially no cross-lingual influence. Um, but as the model gets larger and larger, the uh, cross-lingual influence grows until for the 50 billion parameter model, it's essentially um, just as strong as the monolingual influence. OK, um, so I'll pause for questions before we move on to the next part. Um, if I could ask a question, please. Um, mm -hmm. Conceptually, what exactly does the proximal Bregman response function tell us as a form of ground truth? Just because that's kind of like what this is approximating, mm -hmm. right? Right. So the um, PPRF is not directly very interpretable. Um, so we essentially got that from reverse engineering what the uh, influence function approximations were computing. So rather than being the um, the, the response function for uh, the actual model, it's the response function for something else. Um, but in the second half of the talk, I'll talk about a, I think, more convincing interpretation of training data attribution that um, uh, I think it, like, it can more directly justify what influence functions are doing. Got it. Thank you. Hi, I had a question related to one of the mm -hmm. first few slides related to when you were finding okay. influence functions. Uh, mm -hmm. You were in some epsilon and um, well, like in, in perturbation theory, and this is also in some deep learning theory, when mm -hmm. they have, for example, um, when they assume infinite width in order to do some theoretical predictions, mm -hmm. they correct it usually with uh, perturbation theory. And they mm -hmm. have like this thing epsilon equal to one over the n, where n is the width of the network, mm -hmm. uh, and take the limit of that function when n mm -hmm. goes. In. Is it the same thing in this case, or does n mean something else here? Um, perhaps, perhaps can go to the beginning of the. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, so n is just the number of training examples. Ah, okay. Sorry. Yeah, because I, I skipped this this line there. All right. Mm -hmm. It was a dumb question. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so um, 
All right, so now we'll uh, move on to the second part of the talk, where we try to address some of the conceptual issues about um, what influence functions are actually telling us. And, and so the title is Training Data Attribution Through Approximate Unrolled Differentiation. Um, this work is already up on the archive. And this is work that we did on the academic side. Um, so it was led by my student, Juhan Bei, also in collaboration with Wu Lin and John Lorraine. Uh, and so, as I mentioned at the start, um, influence functions have certain limitations, right? They don't apply to modern neural nets because um, they assume both that there's a unique optimal solution and also that we're able to find it. And these are both dangerous assumptions, right? We never actually um, train the networks to convergence. Um, and so, um, as I mentioned in previous work, we defined this fairly arbitrary criterion, the PBRF, um, that we viewed influence functions as approximating. Um, but I think we can do we can you know, come up with something that provides some more direct insight. Um, and I think there's a pretty fundamental limitation of uh, the formulation of influence functions in terms of the implicit function theorem, which is that it has no memory of the optimization path. Um, and one of the most consistent findings about um, about neural nets has been that their generalization properties depend fundamentally um, on the optimization path. Um, and because it has no memory of the optimization path, um, we can't use influence functions to analyze multi-stage training pipelines. So if we're trying to uh, defend against data poisoning attacks, um, right? So, um, so the attacker uh, might be able to influence the pre-training data set by adding documents to the internet, um, but not have control over fine tuning. And so to generate a successful attack, you'd have to consider um, what training examples would have an influence that survives fine tuning. Um, influence functions essentially have no way of asking that question. And so as a lot of you might've already been thinking, in the case of underspecified objective functions, the most natural question to ask is not so much how the optimal parameters change, because that's not well defined, but how do the final parameters at the end of training change if the data set is modified? And um, this is what I would call the, um, the cold start formulation, right? Like what happens if you train from scratch? Um, it's possible to show that influence functions can be viewed as approximating a warm start formulation. Right? What if you start at the final weights at the end of training and then continue training on the modified data set? And to convince you that these are different things, uh, here's a toy example of a 1D, of a 2D regression problem with one training example. So this is an underspecified problem. And in the uh, original data set, um, we have one training example, and the loss surface is given by the, um, the, the blue contours. And so if you start from the initialization, you find a solution that essentially projects the initialization onto the optimal set, and so you wind up at this blue star. And now as we um, vary the training set, the loss surface uh, shifts to, the, to the, um, the green one and then the orange one, and if you trace out the cold start solution, um, that gives you this response function. Right? We're projecting the initialization onto the optimal parameters of the orange function, and we get the orange star. Now, if we do the warm start formulation instead, we're not projecting the initialization. We're projecting the final parameters of the original training run. And that gives a different response function. Right? So the warm start formulation and hence influence functions uh, do not give us the answer that we're looking for. All right, and so uh, we now formulate it in a different way. Um, we formulate it in terms of approximate unrolled optimization. And so we want to estimate how the final weights at the end of a training run change if we modify a data set. Um, and for simplicity, we'll assume SGD optimization. Uh, we also analyze uh, precondition methods in the paper um, in, the, in the appendix, but the math gets pretty hairy. Um, so here's the SGD update rule, um, and we're writing this as a function of the weight epsilon of a training example, 
Um, and so each time we see that particular example, um, so you so have this indicator variable delta to indicate whether we're seeing that example, um, then it gets reweighted according to epsilon. Um, and in this formulation, essentially, um, all the randomness that happens during training, like the um, choice of training batches, is treated as a random variable. And so what we're interested in is the average treatment effect. So averaging over all the random choices, um, how do the parameters change in expectation um, if we remove this training example? Right, so that's what we're, that's what we're interested in. And just like with influence functions, we take a first order Taylor approximation to this. And so we're approximating it using the hypergradient, which is the expectation of the total derivative of the final parameters with respect to epsilon. And so to understand this conceptually, um, imagine that we have a, a quadratic um, 2D optimization problem where with epsilon equals zero, we're trying to minimize this orange function. Um, and if we look at the exact response function as we change epsilon, um, that traces out this curve. And, and so the exact influence functions would compute the tangent to the response function, um, which is this uh, uh, red arrow here. Now, if we consider unrolling instead, and we uh, train for a limited number of steps, then we can trace how the final parameters vary as a function of epsilon, right? And now we make a lot of progress in the direction of high curvature, and we make less progress in the direction of low curvature. And so don't actually find the optimal solution. Um, we're actually stuck at a, a, a suboptimal point. Now, if we um, trace out um, how the final parameters change, we're taking the Taylor approximation to that, right? We're, we're looking at the tangent to this curve, and, and that is pointing in a different direction. And in particular, because we're not fully optimizing in a low curvature direction, um, that direction has less weight in the response function, um, which is why this vector has a larger component in the high curvature direction than in the low curvature direction. And so this is an example of the implicit bias of the optimizer. And this is something that this new um, unrolling formulation is able to account for. And so our goal is to estimate how the final weights change if we modify the data set. Um, now, in principle, this is something that you can compute using autodiff, right? You can just write a function defining your entire training procedure and um, then call a gradient routine on that. Um, and so conceptually, we can take our computation graph. Um, so each step uh, is represented like this. So we have a gradient computation, and then a multiple of the gradient gets subtracted from the parameters. And so we repeat that many, many times. Um, now, <laughs> this works conceptually, but it would be completely impractical in practice because you'd have to store the um, intermediate parameters in memory, and uh, and those would be way too large to, to actually store. Um, but we can kind of look at the math in this computation graph. And so when we consider each of these steps of the computation, um, when we do the backprop, we're essentially taking the derivative of each of these steps, um, and that winds up being, it's, it's the Jacobian of this step, winds up being the identity matrix minus the learning rate times the Hessian for that step. And so essentially backpropagating through this entire graph um, is just a matter of multiplying by a lot of these terms that have this form, identity minus learning rate times Hessian. Um, and so in order to approximate this, um, what we do is we chop up the training procedure into multiple segments. So these could represent explicit stages of training, like um, pre-training versus fine-tuning, or this could be just something that we do in order to improve the accuracy of the approximation. Um, but essentially, we're making the key assumption that the gradients and the Hessians are stationary within each segment. 
Um, so they'll change as, as a result of sampling a different mini batch or kind of small scale variations in the parameters. Um, but there won't be some you know, consistent change over the course of that segment. Um, and so this method we call segmented stationary unrolling for counterfactual estimation or source. All right, and so how do we actually um, compute these um, derivatives? Uh, so I guess, first of all, what happens when we backdrop through an entire segment of training? Um, and so essentially, we're multiplying together a lot of um, Jacobian terms of the form identity minus learning rate times mini batch Hessian. And um, we can approximate um, this product as a matrix exponential, right? We're just multiplying together lots of matrices that are close to the identity. And so we can approximate that with a uh, matrix exponential. Um, and so e to the minus something times the average Hessian. And so the intuition about this is that if you consider, right, so, so like, um, you know, what part of the influence of pre-training survives fine tuning? Well, essentially you take the Hessian for fine tuning and in the directions where the Hessian is large, the gradient signal um, gets attenuated um, because the fine tuning stage will overwrite the parameters in those directions. Um, and, and so, um, so those directions, the Jacobian will be close to zero. Whereas directions where the Hessian is small, um, the Jacobian will be close to one because those directions get preserved by fine tuning. All right, so that's one part of the backprop procedure. Um, and then the other part of it is um, well, what's the actual contribution to the uh, influence from this segment? And um, I won't go through this computation in detail. Um, you get a formula that you know looks a little bit messy, but the important thing to know about this is that it's a matrix function. So essentially, it's a function that's applied to each of the um, eigenvalues of H. And when you look at this as a matrix function, um, what we find is that it's very similar to what influence functions compute. So in influence functions, I, I guess I skipped over this um, earlier in the talk, but typically we add a multiple of the identity to the Hessian before inversion. And so, um, this is also an example of a matrix function, right? Something applied to each of the eigenvalues. And so if you plot the matrix function corresponding to the damped inverse um, and compare that to the function that we're computing, they're almost identical. Not, not quite identical, but very, very close. Um, and so this notion of source, right? So computing, so, so doing training data attribution by approximate differentiation uh, through the training graph, um, this, you know, in the case where there's only one segment of training, this would very closely match what influence functions are already computing. Uh, and so as a side effect of this, we essentially get a, a new interpretation of influence functions, which, which I think more directly justifies what they're measuring. All right. so. Um, from a practical standpoint, uh, we can approximate source using the same sort of EK fact approximation um, that we used for the inverse Hessian vector products earlier, right? So EK fact actually gives a full um, approximate eigen decomposition. And so you can directly use that to compute all of the matrix functions that we need. Um, how well does it work? And so after we did the original influence function work, um, <clears throat> Uh, a group at MIT actually came up with a good criterion for evaluating training data attribution methods, the linear data modeling score. So essentially, you choose the measurement that you're interested in, um, like the margin on a test example, and you train many different models on random subsets of the training data. And then you measure how well you can predict that measurement um, as a function of which training examples were included. And so this is something that um, very directly measures 
your ability to do training data attribution. So it's, it's well motivated. And um, unlike the leave one out objectives, um, this is actually something that um, current training data attribution methods seem to um, approximate well enough for it to be worth measuring. <clears throat> Um, so, we're, so we're choosing random uh, subsets of the training examples. So, so alpha is the fraction of the training examples that we keep. Um, and so we can compare various methods in terms of their LDS scores for different values of alpha. Um, and the correlation uh, varies with alpha. Um, and th this point at the end where you have essentially zero correlation is very similar to the leave one out criterion for evaluating influence functions. So that just seems to be particularly um, sensitive for some reason. But for other values of alpha, we get a pretty consistent um, ordering between different training data attribution methods. Um, and because we get a consistent ordering, um, we stick with alpha equals 0.5 for the rest of the evaluations. <clears throat> and so if we uh, compute the LDS scores, for various um, single stage training procedures on academic scale models, right? This is the setting where um, classical influence functions um, in principle should do well. Um, it's also the setting where source um, should give very similar results to influence functions. Um, so that's um, indeed what happens. So the, um, <clears throat> so the orange bar represents the LDS score for influence functions and the purple is source. And these are very close to each other. Um, and actually, one of our maybe um, side findings in this work is that influence functions were surprisingly uh, surprisingly strong when evaluated in terms of these LDS scores. Um, OK, but then what if you look at the cases that classical influence functions um, shouldn't be able to handle? So um, we looked in particular at um, early stopped models. Um, so models that were very far from converged. Um, and we also looked at a multi-stage training procedure, um, continual learning. So train on um, one task and then train on the second task and measure the influence of examples from the first task um, at the end of training on the second task. And um, in both of these cases, uh, source actually does much, much better than other methods. Uh, in, in the early stopping example, there's actually a baseline called trace-in that's based on um, unrolled differentiation, but it doesn't use the Hessian information. It essentially approximates the Hessian with the identity matrix. Um, this was a fairly weak baseline in most of our other experiments, but it actually um, does pretty well in this early stopping case. Um, and so uh, you know, considering the computation graph, in this case, seems to be more important than um, using the Hessian information associated with influence functions, um, but uh, but but source actually gives considerably more accurate results. Um, and then for the multi-stage training setting, um, again we we can improve significantly over influence functions. Um, and so in this talk, I've talked about um, two significant challenges in applying influence functions to modern neural nets. So one of them is the challenges of scaling to large models. Um, and the other is the conceptual limitations. So the, the assumptions of uniqueness and convergence. Um, and so in the first part, I talked about uh, EKFAC, which gives us a way of computing influences for large language models. Um, and, and this is an approach that can you know, compute influence functions, but also let us efficiently compute other uh, matrix functions of the Hessian, including the ones that we need for source. Um, this addresses one of the computational challenges of influence functions, uh, namely the computation of the inverse Hessian vector products. Um, it doesn't solve the challenge of needing to compute gradients of many training examples. Um, and so we have another recent paper um, which I didn't talk about, but um, this is an algorithm called Logra, which um, approximates um, influence functions by storing um, low dimensional projections of the training gradients. So they can compute the gradients one once and then um, do a search uh, very, very quickly. Um, and then, so that was the first part of the talk. And then I talked about uh, source. 
which is a new perspective on training data attribution based on approximate unrolled differentiation. So we're starting from the unrolling perspective, but we eventually wind up with something that's computationally very similar to influence functions and can make use of a lot of the same algorithmic techniques. This is something that lets us do something that's influence function-like, but apply it to settings where um, influence functions don't directly apply, like multi-stage training procedures. So, so I think you know, there are still significant challenges in scaling up um, training data attribution, but I think we're making uh, significant progress on all these fronts. So I'll open it up to questions. Yeah, looks like uh, Mike has a question. Mike, go ahead. Hey, Roger. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, I really enjoyed the distinction between uh, essentially editing the final weights, uh, editing the optimized weights, and where the final weights might end up. Um, and I was interested in, uh, in the context of fine tuning, where you want to find influence not on your initial, say, your, your Claude training data, but on your, the data you're using to fine tune. Does that mean mm -hmm. that influence functions are more appropriate in that, in that it is closer to the kind of warm start problem that it was not designed for, but kind of conceptually matches closer? Yeah, so I guess what would happen if we ran influence functions on the fine tuning procedure? So, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I mean, in, in principle, it has a similar status to running them on pre training because, the, you know, it's a single stage in either way. Um, but I think for pre training, um, approximating the solution is unique is more reasonable to do. Um, I, think the, um, I think there's, you know, the, the parameters are pretty heavily constrained in most directions. Um, but for fine tuning, the model is highly over parameterized. Mm -hmm. And so I think implicit biases are much more central in the fine tuning case. So I, mean, I, I think it's an empirical question whether um, influence functions still give accurate results for fine tuning. Um, but I think uh, conceptually, I'd be much more comfortable if the thing that we're measuring um, takes into account the um, implicit biases of optimization. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks for the, the really amazing talk. Uh, I, this is more of a general question, but I wanted to ask you if you have any advice for early career researchers who are interested in the alignment space from your own research mm -hmm. experience and um, what your approach in general to research is. Yeah, um, I mean, it's a tricky question because um, yeah, I, I think if you're trying to get into uh, kind of ordinary AI research, the broader research community is sending a lot of signals about what you should be working on, right? You can see like what's popular at um, conferences, um, things like that. But when it comes to working on AI alignment, um, this is something that kind of had to develop outside the mainstream scientific community um, because there's so much kind of ideological opposition to thinking about safety for so many years. Um, and, and so, there's you know much less the institutional signal for what to be working on, and so I think that for evaluating research directions, um, you just have to spend a lot of time kind of understanding the landscape of what are the um, risks to be worried about and um, the, you know, what might we be able to do to address those risks. And so I think you know this work all kind of fits into the broader scheme in terms of um, like understanding how the models work in order to be able to like, diagnose potential safety failures. But you know I I, I can't really give a you know a general answer for what to work on. I think you just have to think really carefully about um, the alignment landscape and um, come to your own conclusions. Yeah, awesome. Uh, any more questions from the audience? 
Okay, cool. Um, thank you so much, Professor, for the amazing talk. Um, we look forward to obviously uh, future work in this direction, hopefully sharing some papers from you. Um, and yeah, thank you everybody for joining and we'll, the session will be posted to YouTube.